Welcome to the Time Management Podcast with me, your host, Abigail Barnes. I'm a productivity coach, global speaker, time management author, and award-winning entrepreneur on a mission to share the 888 formula with the world and to remind you that it's your time. Leave it to me to bring you new time management tips, tricks, tools, and strategies to introduce you to guests, research, and case studies from around the world, and to give you a simple five-step process you can follow to up-level your productivity, achieve your goals, and create a life that exceeds your wildest dreams. I'm so excited that you're here, so let's get started. Welcome to the show. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by the incredible Serena Lau. Serena, welcome to the show. Thank you, Abigail. It's so awesome to be here. Let's dive straight in. Who is Serena Lau in a nutshell? Today, I'm a life coach. I work one-on-one with lost, confused, high-performing professionals who are stuck and they're ready to get back on track. But if you had asked me several years ago, I'd be telling you I was the CEO and co-founder of a tech startup. Oh my goodness. I cannot wait to unpack this conversation here today. What was your relationship like with time when you were younger? You're going to love this, Abigail, because first of all, I have to say, I'm so grateful to have met you. And I'm so grateful for how you've introduced me to this concept of human design, because everything, including my answer, to your question is answered through human design. And so time for me was everything that I absorbed from the environment around me. And if you know human design or for any of your listeners that have worked with you, they may understand this. But my definition and and relationship with time was never my own. It was when I was younger, it was my parents. I remember going to the airport and everything was just so hustle bustle and intense and everything was about time. And here I am a little kid, naturally very slow. And all of a sudden time was in the air and I literally absorbed it. And so I became this person who had the relationship with time based on the people around me and based on my environment. And it wasn't until I met you and you introduced me to a different way of understanding who I was that I began to have a different relationship with time and I could shed what wasn't mine. So now my relationship with time is whatever I want it to be. So I get into these modes where I'm as crunched and I don't want it to be crunched. I want it to be expansive and soft and I can do that now. So it's pure magic. Wow. For the benefit of the listeners and those who are on this human design journey with us, Serena is a 5-1 projector which means that she has a number of centers that are open, a number of centers that are closed, and the ones that are open are going to be impacting everything that she's just said. Understanding how the world is driving you, but you are you, is the revelation. And it sounds dramatic in some ways if you're not aware, but when you become aware, it is truly, truly life-changing. I really, really love that. And just for the benefit, again, of this conversation to continue it, Serena has got an open root center and the root center is one of the two pressure centers. So the head center and the root center. And if that center is open, you are going to feel the pressure of what you don't have. What you don't have in that root center is the desire and the drive to be productive and just to produce and to be on when it comes to time. So therefore you are searching it out. You are questioning, you are looking around the world. You are asking, why am I not like everybody else? I need to be like everybody else. I must work like everybody else. Now I'm a generator. So I have a battery of energy every day that I need to use up. A projector does not operate in the same way. However, a projector combined with a generator, they can then borrow each other's energy, but it burns projectors out. So if you are continuing to live like a generator, like 70, 80% of the world are, you are just burning yourself out. And inevitably, there is going to come a day when it just all crashes down around you and you have to start over. So thank you so, so much for sharing that. How has your relationship with time then evolved? And what does that look like in your day-to-day work, your day-to-day life now, knowing what you know? 
I think the biggest evolution of it and the biggest realization for me was that I have all the power through changing my mindset, changing what I think and believe about my situation, about other people around me, about the, what the calendar has on it. And it's really just given me this ability to be me. And naturally, I'm a very slow person. I think I said this, like I move at a very slow pace. And I know this because of feedback from other people in my life. That naturally, I move very deliberately, very slowly. And then I can see that when I'm with other people, my husband for one, I can move very quickly. I can borrow that energy and then I can discharge it later. So now what time is for me is whatever I want it to be, really. I'm in the middle of a lot of changing life events right now in my business, in my home life, in my personal health, just lots of different changes. And I know that I have time because I want time. I have the time to figure things out. I have the time to let things settle. And even when I test it, so this is what's happened to me over the last several years, but especially in the last year, even if I test it, I've realized I don't control anything beyond my own mind. So just as a small example, I have three children and it's my job to get them out of the house in the morning. And I used to think that I could control when we left and it was me getting them out the door. And so one day I just stopped chasing them. I stopped yelling at them. I stopped saying, it's time, it's time, it's time. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And we got out the door at the exact time we always do. So you can test it. You can, like, I test it all the time. And, and my testing looks like, well, my hypothesis is that it's me getting them out the door. Let me test that. Let me try something different and let the universe show me what's really true. I love that. And I love that you are now living this life as the science experiment. This is what they say when it comes to human design. How do you even know yourself and know who you are? The only way to know is to try different things and see what happens and then try acting in different ways and see what happens, see how the people around you respond to that. Tell us a little bit more about the journey that's got you to where you are today. You mentioned that you were a COO in a tech startup and today you are working with clients one-to-one. -one. Tell us a bit more about that. If you look at what I've done on paper, I guess about five years ago, it said tech executive, it said accomplished, it said pedigree, it said computer science degree, MBA, multiple different companies, brand name companies, leadership roles. I built the perfect resume. And then one day I realized that that resume wasn't giving me what I really wanted. That resume wasn't leading me to my next step. I left the, the company I helped co-found, stayed on as an investor, wasn't needed day to day. And I happily left thinking, I'm going to go do my next thing. I had done that multiple times in my career. I knew how to get a job. I knew how to find my next gig. And then, you know, as the universe continued to unfold for me, nothing worked. I would go to coffee chats. People would say, oh, great. You know, you've done so many things. What do you want to do next? And I would look at them like a deer in headlights. I had no idea. Now that might seem trivial, but when you don't know what you want to do next in your life and you are aching for something meaningful and fulfilling, it starts to bleed. And for me, it bled into all other aspects of my life. My relationship with the people around me, my own self-concept, how I spent my time and my days until I reached, I would say, a fairly low point in my life and I did not know what I wanted. And then again, the universe serve something up. And all I knew that I wanted was to get away. And in that moment, a friend said, hey, why don't you read some books? And I said, well, what do you mean? What kind of book? And she recommended self-help book. And now, Abby, I have to tell you, when I was growing up, the world of self-help was not in my community, in my environment, in my friend circle. It wasn't considered intellectual. It wasn't considered worthy, noble, respectable, challenging. It was, it was a part of, and I'll say like this bookstore, right? We would, I would go in with my high school friends. It was the section of the bookstore that we never went into. And again, I took on my environment. And so I didn't indulge in that, even though I was curious about it. But here I was in a low point in my life. I went away, found one self-help book and that book and all the ones that I read after started to change my life. I started to just see the world differently, which meant that I acted in the world differently. 
And slowly it shifted everything. I was able to get an amazing job at another tech startup, killer job, loved it. And I also loved the world of self-help. I couldn't, I could not do it. It was like a faucet I couldn't turn off. And one day in this amazing job, I heard myself on the call with the CEO quitting. I couldn't do it. It paled in comparison to just personal development, coaching, and self-help. And when I look back on that process, I realized the, the steps that I took, and that's that's what I take my clients through now, which is how do you go from, I don't know what I want, I just know I don't want this, to I know who exactly who I am, I'm on my life purpose path, and things are unfolding for me, and I'm taking on challenges that I've never taken before, I'm feeling stretched, and it all feels like a pull, not a push. I feel drawn to it all. And my Monday mornings feel no different than a Saturday or a Sunday morning. I absolutely love this conversation so, so much. I really don't want to interrupt you. I just want you to continue telling the story. Chronologically, where are we now in the calendar? What year are we in? That happened early 2021. I left my startup in the fall of 2019. 2020 was a struggle for a lot of people. For me, it was a very personal, internal struggle. And then it was the end of 2020 and then into 2021, where I, through all the self-help tools that I was using on myself, <laughs> I was able to get back on my purpose path. And it continues to unfold even today. I use the same tools to manifest meeting you, for instance, and manifest this conversation and manifest everything that I do in my business and in my personal life as well. 2019, you started to realize this wasn't who you were, but you didn't quite know what your next step was. Your friends recommends personal development. You start reading books. It's expanding your mind. 2020, the world shuts down, but it gives you more time to spend on your personal development journey. And then 2021, that's it. The switch is flicked. I'm following this new path. Doesn't matter what people have told me in the past. It doesn't matter how important the certificates were, are the education, the numbers, the letters behind my name. I just have to keep taking the steps and see where this path takes me. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's exactly right. So when I take my clients through my process, that mimics what I went through. It's so much easier than we think it is, right? In, in Buddhism, we call it the monkey mind, right? All of the the thoughts that we have want to complicate it, but it's really just so simple. And when you start to do it, it's just something that you really can't not do. It feels so good to do what you want, do what you're drawn towards, do what you feel a pull towards in every facet of your life. Once you learn how to do it, it's like strengthening a muscle. It's like going to the gym and you have to practice some reps. And then once you start to use that muscle, you don't want to stop using it and you use it for the rest of your life. As you were saying earlier, it's almost like a, a different educational path. This is the path of experimentation and learning outside of the classroom versus the other path that most of us have followed most of our lives has been the academic books and study and sitting on a chair. But it's only when we actually leave that safety and security of the classroom that the lessons can then be realized in our physical body, as you were saying with the gym. You can read a book about how to get arm muscles, but you're only going to get the arm muscles if you lift the weights. And Serena said there that she manifested me. We met at a networking event. Serena was on holiday in the UK with her family and went on the internet and booked to attend a networking event. Because of her own energy, motivation um, and drive, she decided that she wanted to see who was out there, who was in London and what was going on. And our paths crossed in a group when we had to introduce ourselves. And we were supposed to be talking as a group and very quickly we sidled off and started talking to each other. And it's so, so fantastic. We've been able to keep in touch ever since. That's exactly right. So when I get the hit of like, I should go meet people, I do it. It's part of the process of going back to your purpose path and getting unstuck. It doesn't need to be sensical. 
all the time. It does not need to make sense. And when you let yourself do what you feel drawn towards, things like meeting you will happen. Tell us a little bit more about that here, because I know that we have been so schooled that intuition can't be trusted and emotions are weakness. And how do you even know? And if you logically can't put it in an Excel spreadsheet, then you shouldn't do it. What does the hit actually look like, feel like, sound like in you? That's a really wonderful question. The answer is really what I do with my clients is I'm really lucky. I don't have to teach them anything they don't know. I have to help them unlearn what they learned at some point in later childhood and and adulthood. Because when they unlearn, so for me, I had to unlearn that working and career paths don't come from two Ivy League degrees. Right. I had to learn that the hard way. Paid for two Ivy League degrees, went into tech, had this wonderful career, and then all of a sudden it just didn't feel the way I wanted it to feel. And I had to do some unlearning and everyone has to do some unlearning. And that hit that you're talking about, if anyone's been around young, very young children, age two, three, possibly, you can tell that they follow the hit and that's all they do. They want to go, uh, you know, laze around um, with some paper and, and crayons they'll do that. If they want to, you know, dump out the water from a cup, they'll just do that. So that's kind of the hit. It's this pull. It's this curiosity. It feels like this. I'm just drawn to it. For me, it's like a combination of curiosity and fascination. So that is what is already in everyone. It's in all of us. We're born with it. We're born intuitive first. The only thing that we have before we become become verbal is our intuition and like the ability to cry. <laughs> There's not that many things that we have, but we have our in intuition. So we know what's for us from the very beginning and we know what's not for us. And then, you know, we learn how to socialize. We learn how to become like people in this world that can function, that can go and get an education, that can go and get a job, that can interview and, and all of those things. And sometimes we lose sight of who we really are and what we feel drawn towards. So to answer your question, it is it is a childlike curiosity that sometimes just doesn't make sense to my own mind. And where specifically do you feel it in your body? I feel it in my chest. My chest gets lighter and it lifts. So it's something, it's like this is my chest is opening. That's how I, that's where I feel it, which is interesting. I don't know how that ties into human design. I can maybe book a session with you and we can explore that. But um, that's, I, I feel, I feel it there. I also feel it in my breath. My breath shifts quite a bit when I know I'm on my path. And do you find yourself ever watching yourself doing the intuitive things and then catching up and thinking, oh, what am I doing? Oh, oh, okay. I'm, I'm booking to attend that networking event. Oh, clearly I'm going to be attending that networking event then. Or are you just fully integrated and totally on board with yourself now? I'd say, no, this is a continuous process. I'm not fully, once you, no one wants to arrive. If you can imagine, arriving and having met every single goal that you ever set for yourself, that becomes a quite boring life. And so <clears throat> life is about setting another goal for yourself. And it's about pushing the boundary of who you are meant to become. So I'm always doing this and I do fall off the path. There's a really uh, many beautiful books written by Boyd Vardy, who he explains it really well. So like tracking, you know, your life purpose is a lot like tracking an animal in the wild. And part of what is supposed to happen. The joy of it is when you fall off. And I feel that too. So for me now, nowadays, I get really strong hits when I've fallen off. I have a knot in my shoulder that screams at me. I start to uh, notice difference, differences in my sleep. So it's a very physical manifestation. Or <clears throat> I just shut down because I've overextended myself because I believed I needed to attend a certain event. I needed to show up at a loved one's like birthday party at 9 p.m. I needed to do these things. And those for me, are generally when I fall off my path. And then I can tell that I need to come back because I just start to shut down. That's incredible. So your body is giving you the signals all the time. From what I want to eat to how I want to spend the next hour to what I decide to write in an email. What have been the biggest lessons that you've learned from your journey so far? Oh, many of my, many of the biggest lessons are spiritual in nature. They are a belief, a deep, deep belief that the universe is friendly, that everything is here, even the most painful, they're all here to serve me, every single experience that I have had. And that I also have a very fundamental belief in my bones, I believe that everyone has a purpose. And your career, if you want it, to be in a career, you can have a purposeful career. And sometimes 
when I meet people, they don't have that belief themselves, which is great because they just borrow mine. And you know how that works in human design. I believe it so fundamentally. And they want to be around me because I believe it for them on their behalf until they can believe it. But I would say those are like some of the biggest shifts in who I am now versus me five years ago. Can you tell us a bit more about what somebody would get from working with a life coach? The more I talk to you about what it is that you do, I'd love you to just really explain how it helps somebody. I'd say it helps in a few ways, depending on where somebody is in their life. When we're in a belief, when we're in a mindset, when we're in a thought, when we're in a situation that we cannot separate from, a coach can help see that. What kind of client would come to work with you? The kinds of people that are drawn to me are people who have done all the things. They have the resume, they have the pedigree, they have the title, they have the money, they have they've they've achieved. They have they have achieved so many cultural goals that it's mind-boggling. And they come to me because they're just not feeling fulfilled. They can't extract this inexplicable feeling that I call life purpose from it. Even though they were told that's how you that's how you get that's how you become happy. That's how you become successful. That is how you have everything that you've ever wanted. People come to me feeling that stuckness, that lostness, that emptiness, even though from the outside in, they look like they have it all. So your clients are high achievers who have it all, but feel empty. And they may have been in the same career that was fulfilling to them some years ago. And and you know this also through human design, like sometimes our paths are meant to wind. We are meant to take on something different. We're not meant to stay on one and see it as a straight line all the way through. But the culture tells us that that's how you become happy. And so I have many clients that are in human design, what's called a manifesting generator. And sometimes that is part of their their journey. Sometimes they're not a manifesting generator. Sometimes they're a pure generator. But whatever it is, their human design aside, they just know in their bones that what they are doing is not everything, that they aren't fulfilled by it. And they're asking themselves, what am I really meant for? What am I meant to do? And how does your process support them on that journey to unlock those answers? A few frameworks, being a master certified life coach. But my journey really starts with one important step that I think culturally we we kind of skip over, right? Which is that first I get them to an emotional state of neutral. And the reason why that's important is because my clients show up and they're often in a reaction. And emotions in and of themselves are not the problem. But it's when we're in a reaction and we're in a perpetual reaction that we go and make a decision for our lives or our careers, and then we overcorrect. And so then we're like, well, you know, I don't want to work for somebody who has XYZ personality. So then they overcorrect and they'll take a job, maybe even in an industry they don't love because they just think that that boss is not going to be like their old boss. So it's just a simple example. But the step one, let's get to a place of neutral and come to terms. And, and this is what I had to do. Come to terms with our past. Come to terms with the story that we're telling ourselves. And if it's a painful one, do the work to unwind that and tell ourselves a story that is simple and feels like truth in our body. And so I have specific tools that help clients with that. Then once they get through that, the next phase is to dream and to imagine like a child, like a child would. And, and it's, it's so simple, but yet sometimes when you sit with a coach, that is an intentional time and space to do that. You'll actually do that because most people will say, yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I, I have some understanding of what I want. And I'm like, I'm not quite, when we get into the dreaming, it just becomes so much more vivid, so much more, so so much larger and it, it often surprises them. And that's a really important part because if you don't anchor into that North Star, if you don't anchor into that vision and that emotion and that feeling, then you won't create it. And so that is the top down approach that I take with my clients because most of them come to me and they're ready to do a bottoms up. They're ready to go onto LinkedIn. They're ready to go and look at different jobs and, and, and evaluate them and say, would I want this? Would I not? And that's perfectly fine. But only after you've done the big top-down dreaming. And then the final step is just to start to take action. And then that is where we have to really partner with our, in Buddhism, called the monkey mind that really doesn't want change sometimes (laughs) and gets scared. But it's important to take small action to create that dream. And then that's when the universe meets you more than halfway. And this is the part that I don't always lead with with my clients, but I've seen it over and over and over again where when they actually do the steps in this process, things just start to open up for them and things unfold, just like it did for me when I started to do these steps and I landed the most amazing tech startup gig 
What would you say to somebody who is currently feeling lost and confused in their life? I would tell them it's a gift. It is the most helpful sign that we have as spiritual beings in this human body to feel lost, to feel confused, to feel stuck. It is such a blessing because it's a trailhead. Something's off. Something's not as amazing as it could be. I would tell them that. And I would also tell them that you have a purpose. Literally, you would not be here if you did not have a purpose. I don't know what that purpose is. It's in them and it's discoverable a hundred percent discoverable. And I wish when I, when I was going through this in 2019, 2020, and then if somebody had just said, look, you are meant for something, you're not crazy. You're not being a brat for having all of these amazing things in your life and still wanting more. And you are really here to do something and it should feel the way that you think it should feel. And there is a process to find it and it is not hard. And once you learn the process, you just keep doing it. It sounds like you're saying just stop and look at what's coming up rather than do the thing that we've all been so conditioned to, which is avoid it, distract yourself, go out shopping, have a conversation, scroll the internet. You're actually saying that there's a blessing in what's just happened take a breath and sit down and analyze it. And go with it. You did this, your visit to the US. It was a perfect example of that. You made a trip, and I won't tell followers your entire life story because they should listen to your episodes, but you made a trip and you decided to do something a bit unconventional on that trip that you spoke about. And you even shared it with your followers. That's a perfect example. It didn't It didn't make sense. It may not have made sense to anyone looking at all the places that you could go traveling through the US. You did what was calling to you. And you didn't judge it. You didn't try to make sense of it. You didn't try to do what the culture typically does. You didn't follow. You just allowed yourself to be pulled. If you want to know what Serena's talking about, you will have to check out episode 54 that I recorded from the Nevada desert, where as Serena is saying, I went to Las Vegas and rather than spend the entire time in Las Vegas Central, I spent half in Las Vegas and half in the desert because that's what my soul wanted me to do. And I am so grateful that I listened to that call. And when I was asking Serena earlier, what does it feel like when you just have to do what it is that your intuition is calling you to do? For me, I feel it here. I'm in a place now where I can't lie. I can't appease. I can't be meek. I can't do and say the things that other people want me to say and not rock the boat and not be a good girl and not be the people pleaser. I have to do what I am here to do. We all have, as you were saying earlier, we have this body that we're living in, we have this one life experience, and we're here to really, really experience it. What have you got coming up for the rest of the year going into the new year? What are you working on right now? Right now, I have a webinar, a live webinar at the end of this month, October 2024, for anyone who's listening to the recording. I'll do more of them. It's a webinar on the real reason why you're not living your purpose and you don't know what it is. I also am following... (laughs) I wouldn't say your footsteps, but I'm following the way that I've been pulled into human design and I'm putting together a training on human design for other life coaches like myself. It has been profound for me and incredibly helpful just for me in my own life, but also for my clients. It's something that I offer them to look up their design, go have a session with Abigail. You know, there are two things that typically my clients say have been really profound for them. The first is understanding a bit about their human design. And every single one is like, wait, what you're telling me is really landing. How do I go learn more? And I point them to you. And then the other is actually something that you just said about how you feel it in your throat when you're not living your purpose and versus when you are. And one of the first things that I take my clients through is an exercise to teach them how it feels to be in their body and living their purpose versus not. I don't really know, but every single time they do that, they're like, this is just so profound. And it's something that it's in them already. And they just don't know. When people ask me what human design is, I like to say that it is permission to be you. Does that resonate with you also? A hundred percent. The moment I understood my design, so many parts of my life fell into place and made sense. And it was just an acceleration of like, I think what I probably could have gotten through coaching one-on-one with my own coach. That's that process of self-discovery. But it, it just sort of was like a 
huge leap in that direction. And I remember there's something in my design where I need a lot of time alone. And that has always just been part of my life. And this was on the heels of my husband travels a lot and he had not been traveling <laughs> for like three weeks, not a single trip. And I remember telling him like, I have to sit, I sat him down and I explained my design to him. I explained what human design was conceptually. And I explained to him my design and it gave me the strength and the vocabulary even to articulate something that I needed. I didn't even know I needed. And I sat him down and I said, I need more alone time. And it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with our life. It has nothing to do with anything being quote unquote bad. It's just, I need it. It's, it's indescribable, my alone time. It feels so good. And I think we all have a version of that, but I've also learned through human design that I'm a bit of a unique design. And so I just need it more than maybe the average person. The thing I love, love, love about human design is that every single person and every single design is different it's made up of a variety of different modalities in fact five and it's not just focusing on one specific area and i think one of the things i would say to anybody is we're all skeptics but look into it see how it makes you feel and if it doesn't make you feel anything ask yourself when was the last time you felt and what was it that you had that feeling about? Because I truly, truly believe that we're entering a world in a way where we are starting to become so much more aware of our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions and moving out of the the decades of suppression. And as I said earlier, that the feelings, the weaknesses, and almost we don't have time. We haven't got time for, for you to be upset, for you to be happy. Can you just shush down a little bit? And all of these stories and things that we've heard over the years and attributed to this or that or the other, there are this, there are that, there are the other, they did this to me, they did that to me. The reality is, that most people are only teaching what they were taught. And what they were taught is a very old fashioned version of just passing it on from one person to another. And so are they actually really being mean to you? Or are they just trying to protect you in the only way that they know how? And perhaps it's toxic, perhaps it's traumatic with a small t perhaps it's traumatic with a big t but until we all take responsibility and know better none of us can do better yes yes it is that awareness the awareness of it is 80 percent awareness of everything awareness of who you are awareness of what it's like to be another human possibly <laughs> through this framework um an awareness of what you want awareness of how it speaks to you how it shows up all of that that awareness is in my opinion just 80 percent of of a transformation and living a better life and feeling just so free and peaceful in whatever life you have. I love it. I love it. Tell us something that you do with your time that you don't think other people do. Oh, that is such a good question. I do a lot of things that you might expect a life coach to do. I go on a lot of nature walks. I meditate. I I do yoga. I have a lot of mindfulness practices. I think one thing that might surprise people is what I what I don't do, which is that I don't hold myself to these things every morning, for instance. I look at I look at how things kind of go in the nat in the natural world, and there's nothing consistent like that in the natural world. You don't really see even even when you watch something grow, it kind of grows in spurts, right? It might look like it's growing in a straight line, but mostly it's not. It grows in spurts. There's a cyclical nature to it. So one thing that if you were to just observe me through my life, I really let go of the regimented, I do this every day. And what that looks like is I do what the season and the calling and the pull wants me to do that day. Some days I start with a walk. Some days I start with a meditation. Some days I sleep in. Some days I just take my kids and go eat pancakes. So every single day is is different. And I think I, I say that as like, hopefully that is a gift to other people. And I, and I hope that sets other people free of this idea that following your purpose, that having a meaningful life, a meaningful feeling in your career only comes through sheer hard work because it, it comes from hard work for sure. And it comes from trials and tribulations and, and this ability to just sort of experience a world of emotions and it ebbs and flows. It gives and takes. Like it, it follows this rhythm that I didn't see in the corporate world. The corporate world was quarterly earnings, 
quarterly reviews, quarterly business reviews for your clients and, you know, regular meetings on Mondays. And, and that's really the opposite. So I think I think to answer your question, it's really what do I what do I not do? I absolutely love, love, love that answer. And it really is sounding to me like you just give yourself permission to do what you feel called in the moment to do, aka to live. Yes, I do. And I've noticed that it, once you set yourself free, you in doing so, you set other people free. Somebody has to be the leader. And I did not think that this whole conversation today would be so rooted around human design, but that is how we connected. But you, like me, are also the five line and the five line is the leader. The five line is the one that people look up to for things. So whether we like it or not, we have to be practicing what we preach and showing people what it actually looks like to live. And it, it's almost making me laugh in my own head that our conversation here today is just so much about, well, how do you live? I have a, an intuitive hit and, and I follow it. Oh, okay. Yeah, me too. And we're talking about this and it, it almost seems like it's rocket science because it was so wrong. In our corporate lives, it was so wrong. There was a rule book you followed those rules. And it's like the rules are, there are no rules. No, I do what I want over and over and over. And I've seen what happens in the corporate world and how successful you can be when you chart a path within the constraints of the corporate world where you're guiding yourself. And that is a big point to make. As long as you have some core values that you are following, you're not hurting anybody, you're not doing just what you want to do all the time and pleasing yourself, but you are being a good citizen, a good human in the world, then that can influence and impact the lives of others. Absolutely. And you didn't ask me this, but what I have found is that when people go further on this path and they uncover their purpose, that thing that they were meant to do, it's always in service of the world. It's always in service of humanity, the planet. It's always benign. It's the truest form of who we are. If we really, really follow it, we get to a place of serving others. And that might be that, you know, you you work in a corporate setting, but you're very much in tune with who you're serving. Because we've all come here for different reasons. We all need to work in different roles, different jobs, and in different environments to, to do and to use our skills for the betterment of society, the betterment of the planet, the betterment of the world. How can we find out more about you? How can we connect with you? Where do you hang out online? I hang out on LinkedIn the most. I have a website. I also have a blog on Medium. Those are the, the biggest online footprints that I have. Amazing. And as always, we will leave all the link in the show notes. You do not have to panic. Serena Lal, thank you so, so much for your time and your contribution to this conversation today. It has been amazing to have you on the show. Thank you, Abigail. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. And until next time, my friends, remember, stay safe, stay well, and it is your time. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you loved what you heard, be sure to let me know by leaving a review so I can keep the good stuff coming. Come and say hi on Instagram at Success by Design Training or visit my website, successbydesigntraining.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. Just search Abigail Barnes. Until next time, don't forget, you are amazing and it's your time.